Good morning and happy Sabbath to each one of you and a blessed day today with Good Friday yesterday, Easter Sunday coming, the Sabbath rest in the middle. We are glad that you have chosen to come and worship with us today. A few announcements that we need to make. Didn't I turn myself on? I thought I did. Okay. Yeah, I got a look. I did. The light's on. Okay, this little light of mine is on. All of a sudden I heard myself. We are glad that you're here this morning, and we hope that your week has been blessed. Every time I wake up and I see the sunshine, I think, yeah, it's a good Sabbath. So we're glad that the sun is shining this morning. A um, couple things just to let you know, we do have a second reading today for membership transfer, and we did not know when we set it up for today, Mike and Jenny, that you guys were going to be here. So we're going to vote you out today, So, <laughs> which is their request. We, have, we don't do it this way. We do it a different way if we want to kick you out, but... Um, <laughs> But they requested um, transfer um, down to Klamath Falls, Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is our second reading. We're glad that you guys are here to worship with us today. I did ask Michael to share some music with us. And again, it wasn't ever planned because we didn't know you guys were coming. So what we do is we just take a vote from the membership to allow this transfer to go through. Do we have a motion for... A transfer, we have a motion, we have two hands, so I'm going to take that as a second. All those in favor of this transfer, raise your hand. Okay, Jenny and Mike, we don't want you guys to go, so you're welcome to come back anytime you want. Um, but we do hope that you find a good church home and a good church family. Um, I know you're getting close to family down there, so I'm glad you're here today. A couple other things is we're going to be doing our... Change today will be the last um, time we lift up the book of Mark. We've been studying it since January. We start a new phase of study next Tuesday night, this coming Tuesday, 7 o'clock. We're going to be opening up the book of Daniel, going into Revelation. It's going to kind of match where we're going with our Sabbath school quarterly, the studies that we'll be doing there through what it means to look at the great controversy to see how God is attempting to save us. We looked at it a little bit this morning in our Sabbath school class. I taught this final lesson of this quarter, which was to wait upon the Lord. And part of what we do on the Sabbath between Good Friday, Easter Sunday, is this concept of waiting. What does it mean to trust what God has said to us? But we're going to be opening up the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, this Tuesday night. Um, I am going to be gone for a couple Tuesdays. I'm going to be going to Wisconsin for the funeral of my cousin. So I'm going to take a little bit of time off here. But we're going to be looking, studying, preaching through the book of Daniel. And we encourage you, open that book, prepare, think, look, ask questions. We'd love to be able to have a conversation with that. We also prepared just to see um, for right after church, if you do not have a place to have lunch, Bonnie and Sue prepared a very big lunch. We thought we were going to have a couple of the folks with us. We decided to go ahead and bring it with us today to church. But if you would like to have a simple lunch, <laughs> in the words of my wife, she said, don't overplay it. But we'd love to invite you to come downstairs and join us for our lunch. Um, but if you don't have a place to eat together, we have some food downstairs we'd like to share with you. Um, I do want to say a welcome to our choir. I know this is a combined choir, and I truly appreciate you being here. I just wanted to say, Fred, all week long, I wanted to tell you what you did last Sabbath with a song that you guys sang. That was absolutely beautiful. That has stuck with me all week long. So. Okay. Yeah, so um, the choir will be here tomorrow for the Methodist service, so they are meeting here in our church while they're getting their church repaired. I, this week has been an extra long week, and I finally remembered why this morning, because um, the Methodist pastor had gotten sick, and I preached for them last Sunday. So Sunday is about the only day I try to truly take off, and I realized that I went ahead and preached, which was a very unique experience. 
to preach in my own church to another congregation. But I will tell you, it was a whole lot more fun. It was. And the reason why it was is because they can't risk my employment. So I could say what I wanted and have a whole lot more fun because I never have to worry about anybody writing to the conference for me. And I've had people write to the conference before, so, you know, so it was fun. I enjoyed myself, and so it was truly a pleasure to share with the congregation that meets here. Yeah, and so the worship tomorrow is at 11 o'clock. So we do, if anybody would like to have a Easter morning service, you're welcome to come and join in the, is there four or five congregations that meet? four other congregations. So we would like to invite you if you would like to be part of that. Any other announcements that we need to make? Yes, we will be praying for Judy and Gary. Yep, we will be doing. Oh, one other thing. I just had the most unusual encounter just between Sabbath school and church. Um, It was one of those ones where I've got too many other things on my mind, but it was such a unique encounter. If you know lady came in, and she said every year (laughs) she dresses as the Easter Bunny and goes out and brings joy on Easter morning to people who may have been limited in joy. But she has no names for this year. I thought about three that that I knew of immediately, but if you know somebody, maybe they have kids or maybe they just need something happy tomorrow morning, Come and talk to me right after. She left me her name and her number. I'm going to text her some addresses, a couple names that came to my mind. But if you know of anybody who could have a, needs an unusual joy tomorrow, um, I thought that was a very interesting ministry. Um, she said she usually does 10 a year and she has nobody. So please come talk to me. Come to my office. Give me a name. Give me a number. I will text it to her. I've got about three people that I would like to send her to, but... Um, if you need an Easter bunny tomorrow morning, then we got an Easter bunny for you. Good, I'm glad to know that. We want our church to be used. I had an elder at one of my a church that I had when I first came to Oregon. It was a brand new church. They had just built it just before I got in. Actually, the last thing I did was help them lay one floor in one room. I am not a building pastor, so I was thrilled to get a brand new church and pastor that church. But the head elder there, every once in a while, somebody would fuss that somebody left a mark on the wall or somebody scuffed something or scratched something. And he had this belief that I strongly believe that when Jesus comes again, if we present to him a pristine church with not a mark on it, what good is that? Aren't these buildings to be used? And to me, Tillamook Adventist Church, I am most proud that almost every single day of the week there is something going on. So we don't use it just for an hour on a Saturday. It is used a lot, and for that, I am happy to pastor that kind of church. So we're glad that you are here. We're glad that we can use it in multiple ways. But as we start our service today, I would like to read as our call to worship from the book of Mark, starting in chapter 15. At noon, on Friday, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. And then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthini, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And some of the bystanders understood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. And one of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. Wait, he said. Let's see whether Elijah comes down, comes and takes him down. 
And then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And then the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he died and exclaimed, This man truly was the Son of God. We honor the Son of God today and the worship that we present during this time. Our opening song is in your hymnal or on the screen behind me, 163, At the Cross.
Good morning, church. I'll be reading the scripture this morning, and it's taken from the book of Mark, chapter 15, verses 42 to 47. Mark, chapter 15, verses 42 to 47. And you can follow with me as, we, as I read. This all happened on Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. As evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Joseph was an honored member of the High Council, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead, so he called for the Roman officer and asked if he had died yet. The officer confirmed that Jesus was dead, so Pilate told Joseph he could have the body. Joseph bought a long sheet of, li of linen cloth. Then he took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in the cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone in front of the entrance. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus' body was laid. May God bless the hearing and the listening of his powerful word. I like the cross there that reminds us of this wonderful Savior. It is time for prayer. We are in that moment where we're between the death of Christ and the resurrection. And on the Sabbath day of rest, we have this opportunity to come boldly before this awesome God in prayer. And so this morning, as you reflect upon your life, your cares, your concerns, things that may be happening in you, we have this opportunity to bring it to the Lord this morning in prayer. And he has invited us to come boldly. So this morning as I pray, you can take your posture. If you feel like coming up here to join me, if you have a concerns and concern and you want to just place it at the foot of the cross, at the foot of the cross, you can come and join me or you can stay right there in your seat and take your posture, whether you want to sit or you want to bow on your knees. I will. You can come. I'll wait for you to come. <laughs> Let's pray. Holy Father, Divine Savior, sweet Holy Spirit, we, your people, come before you, bowing in your presence, thanking you for your love, thanking you for your goodness, your faithfulness, and your mercy. Lord, this is a weekend that reminds us of your deep love for us, you love us so deeply that you send to us your only son, Jesus Christ, to, to die, to give us hope that will never fade. I thank you, Holy Father, for what you have done for us, that you have made a powerful exchange in giving to us what we don't deserve and taking upon yourself, what we deserve. Thank you, Holy Father, for that 
exchange. And because of that, Lord, we come boldly before your presence where there is mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. If there is ever a time we need you, Lord, it is now. The world is filled with violence, with confusion, with all kinds of challenges. And, and Lord, on this Sabbath day, you have invited us to come to worship you and to remember this day that you have given to us. And so, Father, we as a community come. And I lift up those who are challenged with sickness and health and concerns financially and mental health issues and shame and fear and anxiety. Lord, you know how we are challenged this morning. And we spread out those things before you. And I ask, holy God, that you'll wash over us with your peace, the peace that passes it all understanding. And so I pray also this morning for Gary, Tratner, and Judy. Father, you know the challenge in their lives with Gary's health. And I pray, Father, for your healing power, that you will touch him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. And so, Father, this day we have one more opportunity to say yes, Lord, to accept your invitation. And so may that be on our hearts today as we listen to your manservant, Pastor Maine, who you have given a message to share with us. May our hearts be open and be receptive to receive the message you have placed on his heart. And so thank you for this day of worship. We give you the honor, the glory, the praise. We worship you, Lord. You are alive. You are alive. You are alive. And we worship you this morning. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. While the choir comes up here, um, Tim mentioned the uh, combined church, so I thought I would tell you who that includes. Doesn't exclude anybody, but this is who is participating today and tomorrow. So I'll start with who's from uh, United Methodist is Kathy Gervasi, who's playing the piano, and we're so happy to have her. Such wonderful talent. She walks. Yes, thank you. And um, you already know Liz Wilkerson. She's from, uh, uh, oh, God. St. Peter. <laughs> God, St. Peter Lutheran. <laughs> Brain cramp. And behind her is Mick Dressler, or Michael Dressler, from uh, St. Albans Episcopal. Now, not here is the United Church of Christ. There'll be three people or more, or no, three tomorrow. And then uh, there's more from all together. It's going to be um, uh, eight more people tomorrow. So just imagine this plus eight. Oh, and Dr. Hill, he'll be here too. Yes. Yeah, so nine. <laughs> okay, so we welcome uh, this, let's call it Interfaith Choir. I think that's good.
Thank you so very much, Fred, for bringing the choir to us today. Truly, truly appreciate that. How is your week gone? Busy? Full? Fun? Hard? It's been a unique week. And Seventh-day Adventist's relationship to Easter has always been a strange one. Because we're the church that worships on the day in between, the big days. And yet, there is a message today that I believe we need to hear. A message that comes and helps us finish off the book of Mark. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 15. There's a Bible in front of you, which is the same version that I am preaching from. My week started off this week with a plan to meet with our building committee to look at re-roofing our church. I did say to the Methodist Church last week that they have deeply inspired us to actually get it done because they cannot meet in their church because mold has gotten into the walls, they let it go too far. We have some leaks, we keep on chasing them, we know it is time and so we met. And we chose through the church board to make sure that we got a 50-year shingle which was a unique experience for those of us sitting in that room, as in most of us would be happy with a 25-year shingle because we ain't going to be here in 25 years. But we did the 50-year shingle because somebody reminded us that some of you will still be here in 50 years. But most of us making those decisions are not. Tuesday at morning we met to go through the three bids that we got to look at them, to weigh them, to see what we were going to do. All of them bid the exact same shingle. We got the very best on the market today because we don't want to keep on chasing leaks. We were just about ready. We had decided exact where we were going to go, some paths to go forward, when my pager went off. Now, I do try to weigh what's going on when that pager goes off and I'm busy. I looked at it, and I can hit on my active 911 on my phone, and I can see of the Neatarts Oceanside firefighters who is responding. And we've been pushing hard to get people. Philip's going to hear about this. If you're going to respond, you hit the button. If you can't make it, you hit unavailable. Let us know if you're coming so that we know whether we should wait or not. And I look, and there's almost nobody responding. So I told the group, we were almost done. I think we were pretty much done. You were done with me. And so I said, I'm going to go ahead and go. But I had a dress shirt on. I had nice shoes on. This was a pack out on Short Beach. Some of you have been there looking for agates. Pack out means that we're going to need good shoes to carry somebody up out off the beach. And so I ran home first, which I don't like doing because it takes a little bit of time. Flipped off my dress shirt, threw on a fire department shirt, put on my hiking boots, and I headed off. And as I was coming through, I had heard on the radio that Tillamook was called. We needed backup. Well, I got back to 131, and the fire chief, I told him later, I said he was hauling through knee tarts. I pulled in behind him, and I thought, oh, we're going a little faster than my chief allows. But I'm following the fire chief, so I'm going to go ahead and get away with it. We got to the beach. And we were told that they were not right at the end of Short Beach. If you've ever gone down those steps, you know, they are steep. They are sharp back and forth. But the problem was about a mile down the beach. We pulled a truck up to another a private steps that goes down at the end of Radar Road. And we started to carry all of our gear, the stokes, our medical bags, everything we needed down the side of that cliff. We got down there. And for two hours, did CPR, because it's a difficult place. The sand has all been washed away. We were in pretty big rocks and had to keep on moving up the beach because the tide was coming in. We finally got the Coast Guard involved. 
By the time they got there, they had to make a decision because I'll tell you something about your Coast Guard and don't judge people how they set up the protocols, but your Coast Guard does not do recovery. They only do rescue. There's a difference. They will only save you if they can save you. If they can't, then they won't transport. We put a little guilt trip on them and said, you need to do this. The difficulty on the whole thing, watching the whole thing pan out and work its way through, was a young mother with a three-year-old child lost her life on Tuesday on a sunny day just looking for agates on our beaches. I sat there. After about an hour and a half, I asked the chief if I could be taken off the CPR group. We rotate ourselves through every few rounds because if you've ever done it for a long period of time, you know it is exhausting. We had about six of us rotating through. I finally asked the chief, would you mind if I go up and sit with the husband and the son? I t said I'd like to take on the role now of fire chaplain. There were a couple other people who had helped civilians on the scene, and I spent time with them. And the difficulty began to become apparent. And I prayed, Lord, if at any time, this week, the Holy Week, would be a good week for you to intervene. This week, above all weeks, would be a good week for you to come back. Because we're tired of this death and sickness and sorrow. I'm getting tired of this. Now, when the helicopter transported, we still didn't know. We sent the Tillamook chief. He's been 30 years a paramedic on life flight. We sent him up on that helicopter, and he went to the airport. Our friend Cindy goes on the ambulance. She did the transport from the airport to the hospital. I asked Pam, and she was involved as our chaplain there. It was a difficult Tuesday, but it was a good day for Jesus to come back. I think every day is a good day for Jesus to come back. It's a good day for Jesus to stop this pain and sorrow. Now it hit me this week. Because my sister had sent a while back a whole bunch of little films, Super 8, 16 millimeter. You remember the old days? Some of you are old enough to know that your mom or dad would have this light bar with these massive floodlights. And they tell you to smile and open your eyes where they're taking a video, or a, not video, film of you. Well, my sister had sent a bunch of these, and we got them trans put, a, put on a zip drive. It finally came. And Bonnie said to me on Wednesday night, we need to go through and relabel these things so we know what we got. Well, the first film that pops up was a picture of me, my sister and brother, climbing on my dad. My mom is sitting on the couch behind. And I had asked Bonnie to stop because my mom died when I was four, and I don't know her. And all I could see was this woman on the beach and this little child who is not going to know his mother. This was a hard week. And all week long I have been reading and studying and thinking and praying, how do we present the death of Jesus Christ? What does it mean to us? Year after year we come, we acknowledge Good Friday, we look forward to Sunday. We acknowledge the death, the burial, and the resurrection. It is the central heart of what it means to be a Christian, isn't it? It is what we share with about 2 billion people on this planet who are professed Christians. doesn't matter where you worship, what day you worship on, how you do it. We acknowledge the life, the death, and the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the heart. All the rest of it is trying to figure out what do you do with that. This has been a hard week, but my week was not as hard as that family, and I remind myself of that. For I'm here on a beautiful Sabbath morning. 
And we have the opportunity to open up God's Word. Reading back, just in front of what Pam shared with us, Mark chapter 15. I'd like to go back to that statement made in verse 39. And then the Roman officer, who stood facing him, saw how he had died and proclaimed, This man truly was the Son of God. The first proclamation at the death of Jesus Christ. The first one to acknowledge what is going on. We've got to put the perspective here. Where are the disciples? They're gone. Judas has already betrayed the night before. Peter is listening for the crowing of that rooster. They're gone. Jesus goes, and we looked at this Tuesday night, Jesus goes to the cross alone. Not totally. We're going to pick up the fact that there were three people <coughs> who worked all the way through, and it's going to become important in the story. This man, a Roman officer, who was commissioned to be there through the death of the traitor, through the death of the accused. He stands there and he acknowledges what he sees. Verse 40. Some women were there, watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger, and Joseph and Salome. They had been followers, followers of Jesus and had cared for him when he was in Galilee. Many other women who had come with him to Jerusalem were also there. I thought about how appropriate for this to be the final verse that we preach as we end the book of Mark because we are just finishing Women's History Month. Who was faithful? Women, but the unique thing that Mark is going to do, Mark's going to pick up something that the other writers don't get so much three times in the next few verses before we get done. Well, actually, we've got to move into the next chapter almost before we're done with this verse. He's going to three times mention these three women's names, which is unique in his particular time because he's going to give witness to an event of epic proportions. But second century, after Jesus, a Greek philosopher reminded people that Christianity is a farce because who was the witness? That they keep on quoting a bunch of women who in that particular era had no voice in court. They were not proper witnesses. And yet, Mark is going to use their voice and their presence to say, here is a fact. This took place. First, a Roman soldier. Now, these three women. And finally, a person that I spent quite a bit of time trying to get to know this week. Verse 42, all of this happened on Friday. The day of preparation. Actually, in the original Greek, it doesn't use the word Friday. It just uses the day of preparation, which all Jewish people would know. is the preparation for the Sabbath. The day before the Sabbath, as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Took a risk. <laughs> it was a pretty big risk. So think about this for a minute. Why is he on the cross according to the Romans? Hey, treason. Heresy to the Jewish people, but treason for the Romans. What was put above the cross? He said he was. No, it didn't say he said. It, he is the king of the Jews. There is no king but Caesar. He is up there for revolution. He had told them the day before when they came to him in the Garden of Gethsemane with the swords and the clubs at night with the torches, why do you come to me like I'm a revolutionary? I don't have any of that stuff. Another beautiful study. If you guys would give me two hours today, we could go even deeper into this. 
For Jesus proclaims his kingdom to be a very different kingdom. And when the disciples fled, they were afraid of the swords and the clubs and the torches. But you and I, this side of the cross, no, we don't have to be afraid of any of that stuff. Because that's not the kingdom that Jesus is trying to establish. But Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, high counsel in the Jewish faith, he takes a risk, lose his job, go against everything that his brothers around him have proclaimed because you've got to remember who brought Jesus to the cross. It was the Jewish rulers, the high priests, the Sanhedrin. They're the ones that did the second charge against him, blasphemy. He said he would tear the temple down, the very heart of what they believed. I don't know what went through their mind when Jesus died and that curtain was ripped in the most holy place. I challenged our Sabbath school this morning to think through that. Take everything that you believe, that you know today, and have somebody tell you you're all wrong. You know what we do. <laughs> we stand our ground, don't we? We know what we believe. You ain't going to challenge me on my sure beliefs. Joseph took a risk. He took a risk with the Romans. He took a risk with his own church. He took a risk with himself. But he could no longer hold back with what he saw. So he goes to Pilate. Most likely his position, his wealth, his reputation allowed him an audience. And he asks for Jesus' body. Joseph was an honored member of the high council. And this is the portion I wanted to get. This is where I spent my week is the very next phrase. And he was waiting what? For the kingdom of God. Never really thought about it before, but Joseph of Arimathea was an Adventist. Isn't that the central heart of what we are doing? Waiting for the second coming? We put it up on the glass behind us. Adventist coming. We are looking for Jesus to come again. We're doing the same thing that Joseph was doing a long time ago, waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Sitting on that beach on Tuesday, I prayed for the kingdom of God. I prayed for this man who was losing his wife, four kids losing their mother. The youngest was three. I prayed, Lord, enough. We need the kingdom to come. Scriptures, as Pam read to us, tell us that Pilate didn't believe it. You don't die that quick on the cross. So he calls for that Roman officer, the very one who proclaimed him to be the Son of God. Think about that. There's a little bit of time lapse going on here. And Joseph is pushed because the Sabbath is coming and the Jews had a rule that nobody hangs on the cross over the Sabbath hours. Pilate can't believe it, so he calls the Roman soldier and he confirms it. You see, the Jewish leaders had already pushed Get these people off this cross. They broke the legs of the two thieves on either side. They came to Jesus, saw he was already dead, and to confirm it, they take that spear and jam it through his side into his heart. He is dead, no question. And Mark wants the readers in future generations not to have to question this. A Roman soldier says it. He's got nothing invested in Jesus. The officer confirms he's dead, so Pilate told Joseph he could have the body. 
So Joseph brought a long sheet of linen cloth. He took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped it in cloth, and laid it in the tomb that had been carved out of rock. He rolled a stone in front of the entrance, and for the second time, Mark confirms that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Joseph and, and James and Salome, were there and saw where the body lay. The women again confirm it. The women again witness not just the death upon the cross, but the burial. They stand as witness. I want you to go back just to that phrase. And what does it mean? Between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, to be a person who is looking, who is waiting, who is wanting the coming of the kingdom of God. For hadn't they put their hope in him? Hadn't he been looked as, as the Savior, the one? He had said it. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is near. And now he's dead and buried. And the witnesses see it. We wait for the kingdom of God, don't we? What are we waiting for? What is it? that we do between Friday and Sunday. We wait, we rest, we Sabbath. What does that mean? In the Sabbath school lesson this last week, we looked at the word waiting, how waiting has within it the concept of hope, and hope has within it the concept of action. What is the kingdom of God asking from us? Let's go back. Simplest way, I thought it was very nice. Timothy Keller, in his book called The King's Cross, brings this up in the latter chapters when he's dealing with Jesus' death upon the cross. And he says, what is this kingdom? What are the markers of the kingdom? He says, go back, Luke chapter 6. He lines it up. Matthew does it too. The Beatitudes, you know them. What are the qualities of the kingdom of God? What is he looking for? What does it involve? He says here, and Jesus turned to his disciples and said, God blesses you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. God blesses you when you're hungry now, for you will be satisfied. God blesses you who weep now, for in due time you will laugh. The kingdom of God is a promise to the poor, to the hungry, to those who mourn, that this is a temporary situation. We reminded ourselves in Sabbath school this morning, we got to go back. I discovered, I know that I am not a very patient person. I like to see things get done. A couple nights ago, we had another call out on the fire department. We had an Oxygen or an O2, CO2 sensor go off in a, a rental. So we jump in the truck. First, we grab the engine, and we decided we didn't need the engine. We just needed a smaller truck with the O2 sensor on it. Chief said, bring that. We had to get out of the big truck, get in the little truck, and everybody was taking way too long. And I yelled at them. If you're going to answer 911, get the lead out. I apologize later because I'm an officer and I don't want to yell at people. And these were new ones. So, Philip, when you get there, hustle. Philip is going to join us this summer after graduation. Learn how to become a firefighter. I'm a big one in hustling. Get out there. If you're going to call 911, we want to get on scene. I like our call times to be quick. We are waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ, but in the process, we wait on his timeline. Verse 22 of Luke chapter 6, what blessings await you when, you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you and cause all manner of evil because you follow the Son of Man. When that happens, be happy. For yes, leap for joy, for great reward awaits for you in heaven. And remember, their ancestors treated the ancient prophets in the same way. Joseph of Arimathea was waiting for this kingdom. And Jesus had said his kingdom was not swords and clubs. But what do you do with the poor? What do you do with the hungry? What do you do with those who mourn today? 
how we stand witness, how we take care of those around us. Timothy Keller says we also got to look at the opposite of that, how to miss the kingdom of God. Because you got to remember, that Good Friday was a whole lot of people looking for the wrong Savior. They missed that kingdom. Verse 24, Luke 6, What sorrow awaits those of you who are rich, for you have only your happiness now. What sorrow awaits for those of you who are fat and prosperous now, for the time of awful hunger awaits you. What sorrow awaits you who laugh now, for your laughing would turn to mourning and sorrow. What sorrow awaits those of you who are praised by crowds, for their ancestors also praised false prophets. Jesus says, but I say to you who are willing to listen. See, I think there's a time between Good Friday and Easter Sunday for people to listen. In the book Desire of Ages, it is reported that Nicodemus, who Mark does not mention, but Luke does, he joined with Joseph of Arimathea to bring the body of Christ down, that during that Sabbath hours, Nicodemus was able to go back all the way to John chapter 3 and remember what Jesus said. When the Son of Man is lifted up, He will draw all people to Him, just like in the time of Moses when that servant was lifted up on that cross and everybody was healed who looked and saw Nicodemus was able to contemplate. You see, the time between now and Sunday is a time of rest and contemplation and thinking, what does this mean and how does my life align with the kingdom of God? What do I do? There's a gentleman named J.M. Lockbridge who first came up with the phrase, it's Friday, but Sunday is coming. And if you want a good sermon from an old African-American preacher, go to YouTube. He's there. And this week I had fun watching him again. I realized there's some strong preaching out there. But I say to you, it's not good enough to just look forward to Sunday. Yes, I celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ along with the witness of those three women because we know Mark chapter 16. They're going to show up again. They gave witness to the cross. They gave witness to the burial. Then Saturday evening when the Sabbath had ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, went out and purchased the burial spices, and they were there at the tomb when they found him resurrected. But I say to you, Friday is here, but eternity is waiting. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I have an opportunity to enter the kingdom of God once and for all. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The promise of this weekend is that the resurrection does matter. that you and I are invited into the kingdom of God today. I have shared many different times that I'm a great believer that eternity is not long enough. That if I can have eternity plus 10, day, 10 years, then I'm going to start believing Jesus now. If I can have eternity plus 20 30 years of experiencing the kingdom here. What if I could have a whole lifetime of 90, 100 years on this earth plus eternity? Is that still enough to know Christ? No, the joy that comes of knowing to how to be loved. We talked about that before, to really understand the love of God for us. That's what people miss out on. So today I invite you to start this moment, this Sabbath, to join Joseph and put eternity 
into this weekend to put God's kingdom solidly in your heart. Bonnie and I moved into Sue's house a little over four years ago. We noticed that there's one tree in the backyard, and it gets lots of birds. So we put up a bird feeder, a bunch of them. We got a little corn thing that holds corn cobs for the jays. We've got some little thistle seed for the little birds. We got a big thing for the sunflowers that we put there. Bonnie spread stuff all over the ground. We got birds everywhere. But four years ago, we thought, we ought to add a few more trees. Last Sunday, we added 27 trees to our backyard, all little ones. And then the other day, in the middle of the rain, I added two more. I planted two trees in the most tor torrential downpour I've ever had. And when you're bending over, digging holes, and it's running down the backside, it's... I told Bonnie later, I must really love you. Because the deal was, if you want these trees, you get to put them in. But then we jokingly said, you know, if we had done this four years ago, our backyard would be full of trees and flowers and birds, and now they're little and we're just hoping that they take. Start right now. Start right now. During this Sabbath rest, to put the kingdom of God in your heart, to put him as your savior above all, to follow his kingdom into eternity. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you that around the world this weekend, Christians are acknowledging, celebrating, trying to understand what this sacrifice has meant. But Lord, today we want to take that kingdom of God into our hearts, what you bought, what you paid such a high price for. We ask, Lord, that you'll let the kingdom of God start now for each one of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you now to take your hymnals, turn to 425. It'll be on the screen behind me. Holy, holy, holy is what the angels sing. Now, when I asked for this song, somebody, and I ain't going to mention her name, said there's a whole lot of fermatas in there. I had to admit I didn't know what in the world a fermata was. And she said there's seven of them. And I said, well, just like Mary had seven demons, we'll cast out those seven fermatas. They're nice holds, apparently. But we decided that this needs to be a happy song, a lively song, so we're not going to hold it too long. So I asked Chris, um, whatever your name is, Krista. <laughs> I want to tell you, I call her all kinds of names, and I just got caught. So I rarely actually say her name. I call her everything else but her name. <laughs> ah, so I'll probably have to quit doing that, Krista. I asked Krista to keep it lively because we want to celebrate what it is the angels sing today. 425. Thank you.
Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the gift of the cross, for the gift of your resurrection, for the gift of your kingdom of eternity. We ask today as we go forth from this place that you will bless, that you will guide us as we contemplate what a wonderful Savior you are. We seek a blessing upon each one here. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen.